Hope everybody's doing well today. I want to welcome everybody to the Unimpressed Podcast today. And today we have a very uh, special guest. His name is Richard Turner. He is a card mechanic. And we're going to talk about Richard and some of his obstacles he's had in his life to have success. And uh, what's going on in your world today, Richard? Gosh, which of the dozen things you want to hear about? I'm off to London to headline over... (laughs) <laughs> uh, there and next week, um, I have. I just got off a, a meeting with all my engineers. Um, I have a tech company with um, my co-founder Adam Tire, who is the inventor of Siri and Bixby and a number of other major uh, contributions to society. And Charles Park, um, amazing guys from South Korea. He's, uh, he uh, was the founder of the founders of Gaia Interactive and, um, and then Andrei Grishny from uh, Ukraine and JP, who puts rockets into space, and John Berkey, who has his own conversational voice AI company. And, and of course, Adam is the father of voice AI. That's one out of about six major things going on. If you want to hear more, ask another question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to dig into you a little bit. Oh, that could that hurt? What are you going to use? Knife? <laughs> What's your knife? Is it sharp? Well, I just want to understand your mindset, right? Nobody uh, understands when... my mindset. Well, let's see if we can figure that mindset out. You know, you've well, had some... That sounds like a good plan. Yeah, right? You know, you've had some uh, obstacles, obviously. You have a, a little obstacle of uh, with sight, and you've done a lot of things, and... Obviously, if you're in the tech space and you're a card engineer, there's a lot of sensory that you use. Can we talk about the sensory that you use to have success in your world with not having any sight? Yeah, that's a good question, John. And I don't look at it as an obstacle. I look at it as one of my assets. In fact, I have to make myself, my wife has to slap me down and say, humble yourself, guy, um, because I can see and do things with my mind that actually a major team of scientists want to study. And um, uh, and it's already been studied from interviews from Harvard to off to Russia. But uh, to answer your question, in my case, what happened is my haptic and tactile neural network, that's the part of the brain that relates to touch, um, was hungry. And what it did, it bullied its way into my visual network. Now I have no retinas. If you saw, if you went and uh, saw an eye exam, my eyes, I've trained myself to give the impression that I'm looking. And as you noted, when we first started, I said, let me know if I'm not looking at you or my eyes drift uh, because I like to give the impression that I'm looking at you. But yet there's no retina in there. But at the same time, the visual images are projected out. Let me see if I can put it another way. The haptic net part of the uh, network, the touch part of the network, bullying its way in my visual memory. And now those two parts of the brain have merged together and are now resonating as one unit. And because of that, it has given me a touch that is pretty amazing. I'll put it that way. Um, in the har- words of one of the Harvard uh, neuroscientists, you know, I have one of the most developed tactile neural networks of anybody on planet Earth. Th- those are his words, not my words. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I've ha- I've, I happened to do something very bizarre. That was, I picked up a deck of cards as a, little kid started practicing and and practicing and practicing and I have a particular type of nature of, I call it the poster boy for obsessive compulsive and I started practicing with the cards and by the time I turned 21 I had the privilege of meeting a man named Professor Dive Vernon who for over a half a century was considered the best in the world with a deck of cards and he took a liking to me and I became the recipient of a century worth of his most guarded card table information real quick little quick background on Vernon he was born in 1894 and he lived to be 98 years old and so he had a whole really literally a century worth of knowledge. And I was fortunate enough to have him pass a lot of that on to me. And then I took what he passed on to me to uh, new levels. And because of that, I can do things with cards that entertain people and people go, make them go, what the Sam go to hell did I just see? 
What did that mm-hmm. guy do? Yeah, I just shuffled those cards. I cut them. I chose which card game I wanted. I chose how many players I wanted. I chose which player I wanted to have win. I even told him what I wanted to deal. And dang gum if he didn't do it. So that's what I do. And it has taken me around the world. And I have a lot of fun. What are you picking up on while you're doing these things? And you said your sense, you know, your one part of feeling and and touch is, I guess, uh, is like plus 10, right? Like that probably. Yeah. So what does that, what does that feel like to you? Well, it it has a a pluses. It mainly has its pluses. Now I'll give you some examples. My condition is called Charles Bonnet. And, um, it, in my case, I see my subconscious projected in front of me in external space. Let me see if I can explain that. If you were looking at a giant movie screen around you, and on that screen was every subconscious image in your brain, that's what I see. I do not see black. I do not see zero. I see every subconscious image in my brain projected into external space. And because of that, I can manipulate. Uh, I can solve problems. I can. I, one of the things I'm constantly doing is writing in the air. I write a number in the air. I have what's called an eidetic memory. I take a picture. I never forget it. Um, so I can do a lot of uh, interesting things there. And that's one of the things these scientists want to study. They want to hook me up to a seven M- T MRI, which is the which is four times more powerful than a standard MRI device. And along with a bunch of other scientists, and understand why my brain is um, receiving all this information or projecting out all this information with no input with no actual real visual input. In other words, seeing what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's one thing. And because of that, and this gets back to what another scientist said, and that is when, like when I go underwater, I will actually feel the, as I go underwater, even as I'm doing this, the hues change. In other words, I'm in different spectrums, I call it. Right now I'm in the blue spectrum, which about 80, 70% of the time, I'm in what I call the blue spectrum, about 30% of the time, I mean, what I call the red spectrum, blue meaning all different shades shades of blue uh, as the background. And the blue is the upper, the, the artistic part of the brain. It's like just random breaststrokes of every shade of blue. And then uh, around that are just every subconscious image uh, thing just floating around. I see everything two-dimensionally, but they're layered three-dimensionally. And then the red spectrum is all geometric. Everything is laid out in grids and shapes and, uh, and different random uh, shapes. Now, um, so when, like when I go underwater, the, I will see the hues. In other words, the, 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 the color spectrum will change because my mind believes that I'm going underwater. An, an easier way to describe it is if you took on a, put on a pair of sunglasses and then took them off, the hues of what you see change because of the tint on the glasses. Then within about two to four seconds, it will then equalize to where it was before. And then when I go out of the water, the same thing. So that's one example. And that's because of the the tactile nerves on the rest of my body are sensing the feel of the water as I go under the water. And because of that, it is projecting to my mind what it believes is taking place, where you would see the water going over your head my mind projects the image of what it believes should be there. That's one uh, example. I could step on something just as teeny, I'm not going to say a grain of sand, a grain of sand, a grain of, and it will feel to me like a rock in my shoe. And then I go down and I pull it off and it's like eighth of a size of a pinhead. But yet mm-hmm. my my senses uh, feel it uh, massively. I'm going to say something very, I hope you have a very mature audience. When I'm with my wife, it's extraordinary. I'll leave that at that. And 32 years of extraordinary, mind you. So anyway, that, that that's a couple examples. And, and of course, with the cards, that's a, let me just uh, circle back to the main reason and the main areas that I've uh, utilized, the touch. And that is the things that I can do with a deck of cards. I can make them, I'll give you some for instance, because people go, oh, I've seen card tricks before. And uh, if you go, oh, it's my YouTube channel, you, uh, YouTube Richard Turner 52, YouTube Richard Turner 52, something like that. There's dozens, hundreds and hundreds of videos of shows from around the world. Because a uh, for instance is you can shuffle up a deck of cards. 
you can say, I want to play seven card stud. I want to have five players at the table. I want the third position to win. You will hand me the deck. I will start dealing. And I will let you take that deck out of my hand every time I go around the table, remove cards, shuffle them up, and then hand me whatever you want me to have back. And I will still make that player that you chose the winning hand. That's a for instance. And um, the touch necessary to do that, my mentor, Di Vernon, said when I first presented it to him, the concept, which was 40 plus years ago, 42 years ago, I guess, for 1999, about 1980, he said, that's not possible. He said, it's not, that is not possible to do because your brain cannot react that fast. Your hands cannot be this, that sensitive and you'll break rhythm. It can't work. And at that particular moment, I was at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. Um, He was sitting and I was standing and I was bummed out. John, I was bummed out. I go, this is the ultimate way of controlling a card game. And he just told me I can't do it. And for about 10 minutes, I stood there. My card master told me what I projected, presented was not possible. Then all of a sudden I remembered, hold it, but I can do it. I said, Professor, come watch my show. And after I got out of the show, he goes, what the hell are you doing in there? What the hell are you doing? I don't understand what the hell you were doing. I said, remember when you said you can't combine this, this, and this? That's what I'm doing. He goes, I don't understand how the hell you can do that. And for the mm-hmm. next 18 months, everybody that came up, he goes, John, John, come here, watch this, watch this, shuffle the cards. Where do you want to step? How many players do you want? And he had me do it over and over. And then two, even two years later, he goes, he still said, I still don't understand how the hell you can do that. But anyway, that's uh, another for instance. I give you dozens of for instances, but that was enough time there. Now, what is your, what's your ancestral lineage? I'm eighth Cherokee Indian. My dad was from the mountains of Tennessee. My dad uh, was a very gifted man. Um, he, well, my grandma, his mom, she was actually a 1962 issue of Time magazine because she would take corn shuck, but you pull off the corn cob and make all this beautiful purses and uh, lampshades and rugs and, and she'd embroider on it. She just had tons of stuff. Somewhere in my office, I have uh, one of the things with that article uh, framed. And so she was very artistic. My dad was a very gifted man. He would actually worked on John Glenn and Alan Shepard's spacecraft in 61 63 circa somewhere in there all the way up to the second space shuttle and um and i would and growing up i would go i would just watch my dad it didn't matter what it was he could fix anything he could make anything and he could work right and left half of the brain right half right and left half he was not just uh, analytical or strictly artistic, he was had a really strong balance of both. And I was always wish I was always thinking to myself, "Wow, I wish I had some of my dad talent. He is so amazing." And so he was just uh, just a real inspiring figure for me. And then it turned out I actually got a little bit of his uh, uh, gifts. And my sister Lori, she is the same way. She's I call her my genius sister. Mm-hmm. She has the same visual situation I do, and founded with her husband and ran what became one of the largest construction companies in the entire state of Idaho. She would build $50 million projects, $10 million projects, $25 million projects, $50 million projects. And, uh, and my, our son is very gifted. He has, his IQ is 155. And so mm-hmm. he, uh, he v- codes virtual reality next to my so wife. You almost, you almost live in friction. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to describe it. You almost live in friction, and friction is, what, 12th, 13th dimensional, you know? And if you think about your thought, you know, your ancestral lineage, if you're basically each dimension is, you know, a, a time period. So you're pulling consciousness from a very old, old time period Lynch. if you're living in friction do you know what modern consciousness looks like compared to your consciousness is there a different look this is a question i haven't really analyzed you know it's just like an old movie right mm-hmm. if you're pulling this consciousness from your ancestral lineage and the the memory bank that's there could be like an old western movie in black and white right but in 
this time period, it may be, you know, color, right? But do you, yeah. do you know, like, is the visual that you use seem dated? No, I, I, uh, I'll just give you a couple of instances and please your audience, you're asking questions and you're asking me to talk about myself. And sometimes it's hard to talk about yourself mm-hmm. without sounding boastful. And I don't, I don't mean to sound that way. Again, as I said earlier, I consider myself very fortunate. One of the Harvard, uh, uh, neuroscientists said because of my the fact that my visual the brain the visual the visual part of my brain is still fully intact that I would be a perfect candidate for a bionic eye and if I would give that consideration the thing for me is I would be going from driving a Ferrari to driving a Volkswagen bug I would be just what you were saying I'd be retro I'd be going back to the days of the 1960s with this a little old Volkswagen bug that you can't even, that doesn't even have an engine in the front. It's like driving around on an eggshell versus, you know, a Enzo Ferrari on the, on the other end. And uh, when I said, that's the way I looked at it. And the scientist said, you know, you're right. Putting Volkswagen bug engine parts in a Ferrari, that Ferrari ain't going to run faster. That was his words, not mine. He was being, but anyway, when he said the word ain't going to go faster, so um, that's one thing. And then mm-hmm. um, I was also brought in to Russia during COVID. There's a show called, and excuse the name, this is their name, not my name, but it translates superhuman, incredible people. All the people on the show have amazing gifts. I mean, I'm talking about John, some extraordinary people. The show actually started in China called Brain. And then uh, Russia picked it up on t- uh, Russia TV one channel, Russia channel one TV channel, the biggest network over there. It's communist, so you only get one. Anyway, um, and they wanted me on this show. And so actually I had to get over there. I actually, President Putin's deputy prime minister is the one that hosted me into Russia because their doors are closed to everybody, but presidents, royalty, and ambassadors. And they, uh, when I got to Istanbul, they were, they told me, you will open the doors for Richard and his guest, et cetera, et cetera. And when I was over there, that was one of the questions they asked me, because you know, you're talking about retro versus uh, contemporary and, and future. They asked me, what's it like being one of a kind in the world? And of course, I just gave some smart ass response. I can't really remember what it is right now, but the shows, you can actually watch them on my YouTube channel. But the thing is, you have to know how to speak Russian to understand what the heck they're saying. I don't even know what they're saying. Even mm-hmm. though they're fun shows well, to do. Uh, the reason I asked that, right? I think you can find the answers to everything in your foundation, right? So your lineage obviously is where your talent comes from. So I came up with this philosophy called finding a perfect audience that where I can use video content, right, to do this. And with this process is I am, I am freezing unconscious, unconscious bias. I can freeze in time unconscious bias, right? So if you freeze unconscious bias in time and you have that data, right, and you take unconscious bias out of the equation, Everything is constant and will be consistent. The thing that you've had to deal with in your life is the emotional part, right? And the unconscious bias is the emotional part, which is, is errors, uh, errors in the brain. So I would say rewiring. If you reverse engineered that and you took that emotional process out, out of your life and this ancestral lineage and talent, has been passed over and passed over. Those patterns might could predict themselves on, you know, why you are like you are. I'm just a little uh, different, and uh, but you have your talents. Mimi has her talents. My wife mm-hmm. has her talents. Um, we all have certain talents. It's a matter of what, what do we do with those talents? I do have a, I'll just use the word again, obsessive nature. My wife, we've been together. We get 32 years and there's probably not a single day that she would say that I did not spend at least 10 hours to 20 hours a day doing something. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was filming the movie Delt, uh, the director, Luke Corman said, let's chill. And I said, chill, that's punishment. For me, the word relax is punishment. To tell me mm-hmm. to relax is to tell me 
to go uh, stand in a corner. I do not like to chill. Chilling or relaxing to me is not fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, Relaxing is punishment. I'm the same way. Just to give you a little idea of my read, right? Is and you may have something very similar. Is a uh, you ever heard of a clairsentient? I cannot say that I have. A clairsentient is uh, a physical intuitive. You know, like if I'm in a crowd, I'll pick up everybody in that crowd's energy and I carry it with me. And I've been trying to block it, but that you know, it caused a lot of issues for me previously before I knew what it was. You know, based on what you're expen- experiencing, is something kind of similar. Do you feel like you take on people's energy? Big time, big time, John. I can tell, I can, I'm actually in one of the books on how to profile people because I can uh, hear someone's voice and, uh, or what, or even just be around them and give you all kinds of information about that person. I will never tell anybody what I'm able to perceive about them because that would be rude or it would make people feel uncomfortable but uh, you're you're exactly right. Um, there is a lot of information that comes off just in the way people think, and what. Uh, uh, and I this even sounds freaky, but I, you know I think it's just I believe there are in the same way there's gravity, there are impulses if that's using my word that come from people's minds that you can pick up between each other. I can scan somebody's body with my hands, and if there's an area that needs energy. I get these like sharp tings in my hand. Or if I get around somebody who's highly spiritual, my hand will start going off. You talked about uh, my lineage is Cherokee Indian. This energy thing with me is something I'm trying to figure out myself. Do you struggle with that? Nope, I do not. You do not. Have you ever struggled with that? Not in the past 50 years or so. Now, you, when you say funnel in the right way, what do you mean by that? In other words, we have that energy, as you're calling it, is coming in out. In my case, what I did, uh, if I didn't have something to focus it on, you'd probably just see me jittering. My hand would be tapping, my toes would be going 200 miles an hour. I would be, I'd look like probably a nervous witty or something. I don't know what, I don't wanna, I'd look, I'd look uncomfortable, I guess. And what I did is I took that energy and I focused that all down to my fingertips. And because of that, then I was able to put in to give you a few a few numbers, I've been working with cards for, I even hate to say this now, 61 years. I'm going to I'm seven, be 69 on my next birthday. Started working with cards about 61 years ago. For 50 years, I practiced three to 20 hours a day, seven days a week. And half of those years, my average practice day was between 14 to 16 hours. So I have more hours behind a deck or with a deck than probably anybody on the planet or anybody in history, um, according to my biographer who's been around the card business for 80. But it's because I took that energy and I focused it on one particular thing. And then, and it doesn't mean that's the only thing I can focus it on. I focused it in the martial arts. I hold a master ranking six degree black belt in Wadokai, Karate, Shotokan, also degrees in Taekwondo, Jikido. What I weighed when I got my first black belt in 1984, where I had to fight 10 men in a row, and it was televised and covered by, it was the front page of the Los Angeles Times sports section. Mm-hmm. And you can go online and watch parts of it. I think actually they had parts of it in the movie Delt. But um, uh, so I take that, I took, once again, took that same energy and focus it on physical health and getting myself beat up a lot. Now mm-hmm. I'm old. Yeah, yes, I have a master ranking. I do not want to fight anymore. It hurts too much. takes too long to heal. I'll let my, my wife, oh, she'll kick your butt for me. She yeah. holds three black belts. But, um, but my point is, I still took and focused that energy into one of my dreams. I basically had Three dreams growing up. One was to be a card shark like James Garner from the TV show Maverick. The other was to be able to kick like Chuck Norris, Bruce Lee. And the third was to have strength like Charlton Heston demonstrated in the movie Ben-Hur. I'd watch that movie where he's sitting at the oar, pulling the oar on that, in that galley and the big bulging biceps. I wanted to be strong because I was a skinny little runt of a kid. And so I took that, that energy that we're talking about and focused it in the three areas that I wanted to develop. And um, I got pretty darn strong. And I was, most of the people that would tell you when I would fight, I was a 
pretty darn good fighter. And uh, and then my card work, uh, you can just Google to figure out where I stand on that. I mean, have you talked on the spiritual level with things like this? Because, I mean, if you, you know, they, I was, th- you know, this is something I was thinking today is like your mind is a very powerful thing, right? And if you have a high level of energy, right, and you're able to manifest those three things, you made that experience for yourself. It is true. But I also, you talk about a spiritual level. I don't for a second think that we're here by accident. I think we're here by design. I think there's an engineer behind the scenes. You can tell, you can give me the Great Wall of China, the Tower, uh, the Eiffel Tower, the Statue of Liberty, and tell me that those things created themselves, I'd say, whoever would say that, they're crazy. At the right point in time, a rock evolves into a guy, and another rock evolves into a female, a girl, and they have the just the right parts to come together and make more rocks, more babies. To me, that's bizarre. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that kind of faith I don't have. There has to be an engineer behind of who we are and what we are. I would say take a cubic block of air in front of you and show me in that cubic block where there is now the evolution of a ant, a flea, anything. That's not nearly as sophisticated as a human. So, uh, so on the spiritual end of things, I think there's a big engineer behind the scenes and we are created in that image do you have entities reaching out to you are you talking about physical or which or just spiritual spirit world uh, well i believe that there's a god and i believe that he reaches out to all of us when you mm-hmm. involve science you said scientists want to look at you i think there's a limitation there you know i don't think they're giving you the full the full money of what you could probably help with and make people understand because I think we need to be taught more about the light than the dark. And I think there's a lot of limitations on certain things structurally, right? That may keep us away from the light a little bit. Does that make sense? And you're exactly right. I think we have the choices of light and dark and Mm -hmm. which way we're going to go with that light and dark. I think there's a conscious within us that gives us a, a compass to go, no, This is right and this is wrong. This is light. This is dark. This is bad. This is good. When you were a teen going into your 20s, what did you think you could accomplish? I started with a theater company when I was 18. And uh, my first director was a man named Steve Terrell. He's 92 years old now. He's a movie star back in the 50s, early 60s. And he was, I call him one of my mentors, one of my angels. He took this long-haired reject of a hippie at the time and uh, helped mold me into a performer. At the same time was my karate sensei, John Murphy, who took me about two years before that, 16 years old. And he, I say, beat heart into me. He Mm -hmm. didn't care if you were blind, deaf, or dumb. He beat everyone equally. He laid the foundation for me to believe that I can do anything I want. And it was just Mm -hmm. through the power of uh, either you're going to take them out or they're going to take you out. And he made me believe that, man, we are the toughest karate school in town. And uh, so, like I said, he beat hard into me. And then my weight training coach was Gene Fisher, who in 1963 had the world record for the curl, 226 recorded, 226 unrecorded. And uh, he's the one that uh, became my uh, physical trainer. And I got to where I could do 500 push-ups, 12 minutes, 9 seconds, 340 on the bench press, weighing in at 168, which is almost twice my weight. So a 250-pound man with a 300-pound man would have to do 600 pounds to have it be apples to apples. Uh, developed a, quite a bit of strength. Uh, so anyway, I, uh, I'm circling back. Those are just some of the other areas that I have focused the energy and uh, now I'm focusing it on our tech company. Just so privileged to have such an amazing team. And Adam Chire, he's, he's one of the most brilliant men on the planet. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he's called the father of voice AI. I mentioned that at the, at the front. He started working on Siri in 1993. Took him 18 years to develop Siri. 
And then as soon as Steve Jobs saw it, he goes, you want to come over to my house for dinner tonight, tomorrow? And Steve Jobs wooed him for 37 days in a row. And every day he came over, that price went up and up and up. Now, the energy part, do you feel your energy, do you feel it physically coming out of any parts of your body? Is it more of a mental? Oh, yeah. No, oh, mental and physical. And that's okay. kind of, there's an interesting uh, angle on your question there, John. And it's a pretty good, it's a good one. Uh, people like, I'll just use an example of weight training. They try to use all physical. They come on, make the guy just grunt it out. That's just trying, that's just combining. That's just pulling from the body. It's not putting body and mind together. What I do when I, when I want to do something really hard, um, I have mental images that I will see. I'll give you a couple examples. Let's say I'm doing a bench press. I will see projected uh, up above, connected to the bar, a cable goes across two pulleys. On the other end of the pulleys is either a counterweight or sometimes I'll see the image of Arnold Schwarzenegger and a gorilla and, uh, and, they're, and they're pulling that down as I'm pulling up. So what I will do, and you can't do this the whole time. What I do is when I get to the point of exertion, I will then employ this, combine the mind with the body, and my mind will see that image, and I will then transfer the weight to that, that counterweight pulling down, and my muscles, they will no longer feel the stress as I continue to press, and I will not get lactic acid buildup. So I can do tremendous amounts of repetitions. Another example, one that may, might be visually easier to uh, understand. Say you're laying on the ground and you're doing a, a tricep extension, like you have a dumbbell. And when you're you have a vertical to the ground, when you're doing that extension, when you're, when you're contracting the tricep, is when you're doing the work. Now, what I will see is a hammer falling. And when is the least amount of resistance with gravity? When that hammer's going down. Because the gravity's pulling the damn hammer down. So I will see a hammer falling at the point of exertion. Hence, I can do tremendous reps and I don't get lactic acid buildup. So that's another example of combining mind with the body. And by blending them together, you can increase your output, in this case, physically, many fold. Mm -hmm. My wife, I taught her that this, oh, probably 20 years ago. She doesn't have the visualization capabilities that I do. This is strictly uniquely to my, my case, to my particular case. But what she was able to do is look into a mirror. And I told her, when you get to the point of exertion, look at that image of you lifting that weight and see that other person pulling that weight up. And in 30 days, she increased her muscular strength, which was measurable at that time because she was top athlete. By 30% in one month. What do you hear from my voice? Oh, See, I told you I don't answer those questions, but I'll tell you this. You have a very rich voice. I like your voice. You have a very good voice. Any thought of what, you, what you're what you thinking over there, what the senses are picking up? There's a lot of curiosity in you that you, you're you still looking for answers to. And what, what do you think I'm looking for answers to? Are you looking for spiritual answers? You're looking for answers, answers to understand yourself? You're and looking for answers to understand why you have certain, uh, I'll just, I'll use a word, gifts, certain uh, things that you, certain abilities that you have. As far as we know, we all have, but we just don't know it. We don't exercise them. We just live our lives and don't uh, tap into them and don't tap into how miraculously we are actually created. Have you ever studied bloodline? Uh, no. If you're talking about lineage, blood, lineage bloodline? Mm-hmm. No, just other than what I already told you, just what I knew about my particular family. And I really have been wanting to do that. now. Cause it, well, it's very interesting that you have some Cherokee in you, right? I mean, you look great and, you know, you look in good shape. And, you know, I think there's something to be said about that. Yeah. My dad, he was in as good a shape. Well, he they, when he passed away, he, he, had a, he fell and hit his head. But they said he had the insides of a 40-year-old. And he was 75. My aunt Johnny, she's pure Cherokee. She stands about six foot three, John. She towers over me. She's a, my aunts are like huge. I said, I, do that. I didn't know the Indians grew that tall. And, but she's just sweet as all get. Of course, now she's in her 
I think in her 90s, unfortunately, because I really love her to pieces. And one of my aunts lived to be 106. And I visited her when she was 92. And I thought that was, you know, that was going to be the end of it. And it turned out she lived another another uh, 14 years. And if I would have known that, I would have went and visited her again. But her husband, Roscoe, during World War II, uh, was in these high-state games in Dallas and won a car dealership, a cattle ranch, and an estate all at the poker table. And during World War II, my dad would fly in to help them move their stuff that they won in the poker game. They probably won't let you in the casino, will they? I'm a legend in the casinos. I can tell you the private numbers of their top security people. Uh, the, the, will they let you play? Them. They will let me watch. Because you could probably get very, very rich. I'm already very, very rich. <laughs> Richer than I ever thought I'd be. I'll put it that way. I'm not very, very rich. My, my friend, my friend Adam, he's very, very rich. I'm just gotcha. rich. I'm just, I, I have more than I ever believed I would have. I'll just put it like that. You know, you said something about wanting to do something. I'm the same way. Like every day I get up and I'm trying to, I forgot about yesterday. Every day's a new day. I get up and I go to work, you know, and I don't think about, I think the money is like a default, you know, there by default, but my yes. passion is coming from somewhere else. You know what I mean? Oh yes. Big time. And then and if your passion is only money, you know, so you have a one with a, a with a, a few more zeros past it. What does it mean? Doesn't mean I much. Mean, I really. like things. I'd rather have money than not have money. Let me be clear about that. I yeah. like that we're comfortable. We have a beautiful house. We have 19 rooms in this house and uh, we have no debt and I like being free. I like not having banks, um, you know, controlling you and whatever else, you know, I like the freedom of money, but if money is your only objective, all you do, all you end up with is one with some extra zeros behind it. If you have two more zeros behind yours than I do, what do you really have? You mm-hmm. have a few zeros, period, period. That's it. You know, we've been talking. I could probably talk to you on and on and on just because I want to pick your brain. But what's the agenda for the tech company and what's your goals with your involvement? Well, I'm the CEO of the company. Adam is the COO. And what we are going to be doing is we're going to be bringing conversational gaming, interactive gaming to the world. You will be able to play any game. Well, I have a number of my own intellectual uh, products that have combined three of the elements of the biggest classic in history, Blackjack, which is the most popular banking game in the world, Monopoly, which is probably the most recognized board game, and Poker is the most played card game. And I synthesized those into its own entity with elements of each, uh, making them a little more, a little easier to uh to play and so that is the first thing and that's what um my engineers are designed and you'll and you'll be able to play everything by voice we have a patent pending on a conversational gaming platform oh, we have a patent on a conversational gaming platform where you will be able to sit down at a giant iphone just picture a giant iphone all touch screen and eight players sit down there and you'll be able to talk to the player you'll actually Believe it or not, hear my voice. I will be the narrator um, and the host of the games, as well as another character, uh, Misguided, which was my wife's character when we performed together 30 years ago. So you will actually be able to talk to it, and you'll say, I want to play, hello, hey, Shark. I want to play Shark Showdown. All right, well, sit down. Don't worry about the rules. I'll teach you. I'll lead you along the way so you don't have to worry about rules. You don't have to worry about buy-ins, the busy work, the app. We'll take care of all of that, and all you will have to do is enjoy the gaming process. And you'll be able to play it on different in different uh, ways, either uh, with the app by itself or with other players or um, with other players for real money. It's called real money gaming. Now, when you said it's one voice. El- that's just one element of multiple. This tone effect. The outcome, if it's being voice driven? No, the, 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 the technology nowadays is so amazing. You can talk to your Siri mm-hmm. and have music playing all around you. And that Siri will know your voice and not record the external uh, noises or voices around in most cases. And uh, now it's even becoming more directional to where you will, um, it will be able to just 
tune in and tone in on just your voice. So, uh -huh. um, yeah, the, 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 it's amazing. And two of our, our team, once again, is Adam and, uh, and John Berkey, both who have their own uh, conversational voice AI technology. So I'm just blessed that two of the most brilliant people on the planet are part of the team. Are, well, we're part of the team. We are the team. We're, yeah. we're part of the team with other members of the team. And yeah. then Charles yeah. Park, he, like I said, he was the founder of Guy Interactive and he pioneered the actual, what's called uh, uh, the different currencies, the fantasy currencies and all that stuff, which is now standard play. But he's the one that pioneered those uh, concepts. And he um, is just an absolute marvel and wonderful, brilliant man. Like I say, he's from South Korea, and uh, but he's lived here most of his life. Anyway, so he, he's, he's just fun. And then Andrei Grishny from Ukraine, he runs triathlons. Um, so he's, uh, I, I, I greatly admire him because... You know, I, as being an athlete, I never got to the stage of doing a triathlon. I've done mm -hmm. partials, but I've never done full triathlons. And he's com he was a competitor in the triathlons. And um, and then another one of our guys, um, JP, he, of course, he worked with uh, on Bixby with Adam, which was Adam's counterpart to all the Siri uh the devices for the Siri, uh, for Apple, Siri is on 2 billion Apple devices and Bixby's on 800 million Samsung devices. And JP was one of the, Jonathan Polly is his full name, JP, affectionate. And, now, and he puts rockets into space. He's an engineer uh, in charge. Now you, ha you have a book too, right? Uh, yes, but I do not want to publish it. You don't I want have, to publish it? No. I at well, some point I will. In fact, I was actually talking to my uh, engineer, uh, no, my, um, my front end engineer, Charles, this right before I got on with you, because I've been saving it for the right time. And um, he, uh, Charles, actually does uh, help run the Facebook page and elements for the government of South Korea. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he's uh, quite up on uh, all different forms of uh, social media. I think you could do a lot for humanity. You know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, we're, we're a meta partner. We're one of 30 companies in the world. It's a meta partner. And, you know, it's weird that when I started studying human behavior on social media with what are I, whatever I have going on, being a clairsentient and these, these sensibilities is that information gave me a lot of, a lot of rationale to solve problems. And I think um, I think you're undervaluing yourself if you don't take this to the next level of humanity, because I think there's a lot humanity could learn from you from your own perspective, not from a scientist. You know, I think you're probably smarter than the scientist. And my uh, guy, he uh, gave me a rundown on your stuff. And um, in Meta, uh, I was just in contact with the, which is the parent to Facebook. I've been the speaker at Facebook and they're all coming in, not all, but some of the people from Meta, the executives are coming in to see me at the castle next month. And Adam was also performing there. He had a love with magic as a kid. And that's, he used those principles to create what became Siri. And then he circled back to He's probably seen more magicians than anybody else on the planet. And his last company, Viv Labs, he had 180 of the top magicians from around the world. He'd fly them in to form at his, uh, uh, his main offices. Um, but yes, and you're, I think we all have something to contribute. And uh, there's uh, a lot of things going on that I think I, I'm contributing to society in a positive way. I actually uh, started putting up on my YouTube channel uh, just clips of, I have, I, have, I have tons of content. I've been all over the world and I have this guy, David Reichelt. He created the game Color Switch, which in 19 or 2015, 2016 was the number one app in the world, 300 million downloads. And he just follows me around the world with all his fancy camera equipment, just filming everything I do. I go, David, you know, do I do we have to get shots every 30 seconds? Yeah. And he's getting ready to go with me to the UK. He's been with me to Russia, Australia, Af Africa. Anyway, and I said I have and he just uploads it to my Google Drive and I have terabytes of just footage sitting up there. And finally Charles said, take that and start sharing it. And 
And uh, so I'm put, cutting it up in uh, shorts, uh, put a quote from some inspirational person or one of my own. Um, one of mine is take possible out of impossible to a day. When did I start that? We started, they started going up this Monday of this week. Uh, YouTube 52, Richard Turner 52. Richard Turner 52 is my YouTube channel. And he's all they put also put on Facebook and Instagram. But I'm, you know, I've never been a big social media follower. I don't even, I've never even actually been to my own face, my own web, what do you call it? Web, my own website, yeah. my YouTube channel. You know, I've had millions and millions of people go to my YouTube channel and I've never actually been there myself. Well, it's been a great conversation and a lot of things we can learn from you and high intelligence there that I can definitely, definitely see. And, um, you know, you've had an amazing life and, you know, it's, um, I'll just keep doing what you're doing. You know what I mean? I appreciate that. That's kind of you to say. And as I said, I've been very blessed and I'm very, very fortunate. And um, if we take what we've been given and do something with it, we can go as far as our limitations will allow us. You know, we put our mm -hmm. own limitations on ourselves. I say, take it and go. Run. Have fun. Yeah. And, and one more quick thing. Enjoy the journey. People look at the end goal. That's not the, what you want. It's the journey getting there. It's the adventure getting there. Who wants to read a book that, you know, the hero, he wins again. He wins again. He won this. He won. Nobody. You know, you don't want to watch yeah. a movie where there's no contrast. There's no conflict. Look at each of the situations as part of the adventure, good and bad. When I have a bad situation, like I, uh, some kind of, usually in my case, is physical injuries for doing something stupid, like doing a backflip off the front porch and driving my fifth vertebrae out my belly button. And I just look at it as a new adventure, a new hurdle to be able to climb and surmount and move on from and, and yeah. look at the adventure as fun. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's kind of the, my last parting words for whatever they're worth. Appreciate you coming on the show. This has been card mechanic, Richard Turner, someone you definitely need to check out. Someone you definitely can learn something from. It's been a great show and I appreciate you coming on. And I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bang Productions. Mm -hmm.